I would like to start with the lady who asked about Stargardt's disease. Yes. Um, there is research going on to, into Stargardt's disease, but essentially Stargardt's disease gives the equivalent of dry macular degeneration because what happens is that the photoreceptors in the center of the macula die. Um, and we know Stargardt's disease is a genetic disease. So we, or different researchers have found the genes responsible for that. It is believed, but not yet in clinical practice, that maybe if we can inject certain genes into the eye, we might be able to modify the degeneration of the light sensitive or photoreceptors, which will allow the Stargardt's disease patients to be able to retain or regain some of the vision. Now, the reason why, well, so it's a slow process. We'll get there eventually, hopefully. Now, gene therapy, um, I'm not sure whether any of you have been watching TV over the past week. Um, there is a professor in uh, um, Oxford who has been injecting genes in, into um, somebody's eye for another inherited disease called choroideremia. And the reason why they've chosen that particular disease is because it's fairly, it's very rare. And you can easily modify the genes that you're injecting into that eye. And if the process works, then that can be transferred to other diseases, other inherited diseases, including Stargardt's disease. So there is progress, but it's very, very slow. But there, there is progress. OK. So unfortunately, there's no cure overnight. And, and therefore, we still have to depend for Stargardt's disease, cone dystrophy, and other inherited diseases, we have to re still rely on rehabilitation rather than actual treatment. But eventually, we hope to get there. Now, um, Lucentis, um, essentially, as uh, Mr. Rima said, it's a molecule that you inject into the eye in order to block vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. So we call Lucentis and Evastin and all the other bits we call anti-VEGF because it blocks the molecule that makes the blood, abnormal blood vessels grow in wet macular degeneration. And by blocking those, um, I call it, you seal the leakage. And I, you know, but unfortunately, the, the sealant or the sealing the leakage because the molecule, more molecules have been produced, the, the sealant only works for a while and then the blood vessels start leaking again so you have to keep repeating the injections. Um, the simple way I describe it is like, uh, I think all of you are old enough to know about lead, so lead soldering. You know, in the olden days, you didn't throw your cooking pots away. When it's leaking, uh, you sort of welded it, and then you keep using it. But the lead solder, solder can come off, and you'll have to go back and lead solder. It's the same principle. So each time the leakage you know, starts again, you have to go and give another injection. A research shows that you give three injections at the start, at monthly intervals, and then after that you see the patient, and then if it's, it's, there's still a recurrence of the leakage, you go and re-inject, okay? We know on the average, in the first year, most patients will require about six to eight injections, and then in the second year, maybe four injections. But Initially, we thought, well, after the two years, then the leakage self seals. But unfortunately, we found that that's not the case. There are some patients who, five years down the line, are still requiring treatment on and off, not as regularly as they did at the beginning, but uh, on and off. So we think the, uh, the two ways we can handle that problem, either to produce longer-acting anti-VEGF agents that you inject into the eye, maybe not every month, but maybe every two months or three months. For me, the ideal will be three injections. Uh, well, an injection that lasts four months. Unfortunately, we haven't got it yet. And if you have an injection that lasts four months, you inject, you know, and then the effect will last for four months, but it takes a while for the leakage to start. So maybe two injections overall in a year. We haven't gotten there yet. Now, the producers of Lucentis now have agreed, and they actually carry out research to see whether you can inject put in a little port uh, that slowly releases the agent uh, over a period of several months. And then, therefore, you may not require uh, so many injections. The technology, unfortunately, is more complicated than it sounds. But again, work has started on that. Now, we have a new anti-VEGF agent called ILEA, produced by a different company. And that company suggests, uh, says that uh, 
if we give three injections, again, at monthly intervals, maybe you only need to repeat the injections. After the first three injections, you only need to repeat it every other month. That's at two monthly intervals. Uh, we'll have to see it in practice to know whether that's the case or not. Now, fortunately, NICE is looking at that, that new um, treatment of ILEA, uh, and hopefully by the end of May, we will have an idea as to whether they will approve it or not. Now, there are other, you know, other drugs that have been developed, but they are not as far forward as uh, ILEA. Um, and again, some of these may be used in conjunction with Lucentis or on their own, but again, the idea is to enhance, you know, enhance the effect as well as prolong the interval between injections. Um, Alcon have their, their product. Um, same way Allegan, uh, different companies have their different molecules that they're developing, but we'll have to watch this space and see. Now, unfortunately, there is no such treatment for dry macular degeneration yet. There's no drug that has been found to be effective for dry macular degeneration. Again, there is research going on um, suggesting that you might be able to re reduce the rate of progression uh, um, uh, in these patients so that you preserve the central vision. Now, for the wet, back to the wet type, there you all heard about radiotherapy. Now, radiotherapy in wet macular degeneration is not new. Uh, we did use radiotherapy um, in 1990 to 96, but we used what we call the external beam radiotherapy, the same radiotherapy as equipment that is used to treat cancers. So we sent you to the radiotherapy center to have your 10 doses of uh, uh, radiation, um, but we abandoned it because it worked up to a point, but not as well as it should, and the logistics of the treatment uh, was quite complicated. So uh, more recently, a new company has come up which has developed uh, a little box um, that delivers radiotherapy directly to a small area at the back of the eye. You fix your head uh, at the slit lamp, the machine we use to examine your eye. They attach the X-ray to it, and it will deliver a specific dose of radiotherapy to the back of your eye. It's called eye ray. And uh, if you combine that tr one treatment with multiple doses of Lucentis, you reduce the number of Lucentis injections you have to give. It doesn't replace the Lucentis injections completely, but it will probably half, you know, reduce the number of injections you have to give. So you give three injections, uh, give your uh, IRA, and then, you know, maybe uh, after the first year you may give uh, uh, four or six injections instead of the eight that uh, you would have received otherwise. Now, unfortunately, NICE, again, hasn't looked at it yet. They are in the process of looking at it. Um, and therefore, it's the treatment currently is only available privately. Um, and so if you go to um, Optegra or one of the other uh, private hospitals, you might be able to get it, but it costs about five to 6,000 pounds per treatment. Um, yeah, but um, I wouldn't advise people to, um, you know, um, everybody to rush for that because uh, I think there's still a few things we need to clarify about it before we must recommend it. The, the stem cell story is, again, it's a very distant one. Um, stem cells, uh, first of all, there are some who believe stem cells work for any disease. Okay, and there are some who think that stem cells should be limited to particular diseases, and in macular degeneration there are there is research f going on for stem cell therapy, but mainly for the dry type of macular degeneration. And the reason for that is you want to be able to replace replace the cells underneath the photographic film. We call the retinal pigment epithelium. And that's what degenerates first in macular degeneration, whether it's the dry type or the wet type. So if you can replace that layer of cells, then um, you stop the process, okay, getting any, any more advanced. Now, in order to treat the wet type of macular degeneration with stem cells, you have to inject particular cells that will mend the leaking blood vessels, as well as replace uh, the, the, the light sensitive cells that have died. Uh, which is why I think that is slightly more far-fetched than 
the stem cells for dry macular degeneration. But unfortunately for either of them, it's, you know, it's, there are research projects going on. They haven't reached their fruition yet. Now, so again, about the dry type of macular degeneration, there are two teams in the UK undertaking stem cell research. One is in Liverpool and one is in um, uh, London. Actually, if you put uh, Cambridge in, uh, sorry, uh, Oxford in addition, that makes it three. And the idea is that you inject cell, these stem cells that will allow um, the, that layer of retinal pigment epithelial cell to heal and then preserve the, the light sensitive cells and allow the eye to continue functioning as normal. Now, but you have to be able to identify what those stem cells are, and you have to be able to inject them in the right place, and you have to make sure that they stay where you want them to stay and that they don't produce other things. So um, a lot of work to be done yet before we get into actual clinical practice. Now, um, you may have read from uh, uh, the Digest that uh, there is the macular disease Macular Society, I keep saying my MDS, um, tells you how long I've been associated with the society. Um, uh, the Macular Society is funding two bits of research on uh, stem cells, um, um, one in Liverpool and one in London. And again, the, the idea is to grow these cells on a, on a thin layer, the pigment epithelial cells, and then to be able to inject them underneath the retina. And that way, uh, you might get some action. Now. The reason why we don't transplant retinal pigment epithelial cells di directly is that they will be rejected. Okay, the, when you inject, when you you know uh, transplant retinal pigment epithelial cells, either taken from another part of the eye or from another patient, they get rejected and they change their their function, uh, which is why it's hoped that stem cells may have something to offer compared to ordinary <coughs> transplantation. But we'll have to wait for the research to be uh, to be done. Now, unfortunately, uh, again, um, we were hoping a few years ago that we, in a few years' time we might have eye drops that will cure wet macular degeneration. The problem is that when you put eye drops in, they don't get into the back of the eye because the, the, the barrier for the, for the drops to get into the back of the eye is quite significant. Um, but actually, one company went as far as going to what we call phase three trials, you know, because they thought that they were able to get a particular molecule, to get an anti-VEGF, to get to the back of the eye. But unfortunately, the concentrations were not enough, but they were not high enough for an effect to be noticed. So that company has abandoned the trial. Uh, they only abandoned that trial last year. So unfortunately, again, we have to wait a bit longer to, to get any topical or you know, eye drops to be able to uh, help us with macular degeneration. Um, Intraocular implants. Now, some of you may have heard about telescopic implants being uh, put into the eye to magnify things. Uh, again, yes, this is useful in a selected number of patients, not in everybody. And we, if you're going to use it, it has to be in patients who have, in the, particularly the wet type, where the disease has stabilized. You've treated it, and you've dried up the macula. And the idea is that the telescope gives you magnification. It's equivalent, it's equivalent to using a magnifying lens, but except that this is implanted into the eye, it gives you magnification and makes you read better. Um, but um, I, now I've heard a story uh, where somebody is supposed to be driving with one, uh, but I would be very careful in believing those stories because it makes everything huge. and. Uh, and, and I don't think that's the way to go. But again, patient selection is very important. You've got to be select the patient, and you do different tests to be able to determine whether that particular patient will benefit from the implant or not before you go ahead. Um, it's freely available. I call it freely available um, on uh, in on Harley Street in London, and uh, I think each each implant costs about ten grand. So. Um, uh, so, but I wouldn't go paying for it until they've done specific tests to be able to determine whether you in particular will benefit from that implant or not. And normally it's done in one eye. Um, um, having tested that, you know, you'll benefit. Uh, now, it's again, hopefully, NICE uh, will look at it later on, not immediately, look at it later on to be able to tell us whether it has 
any value or not. Now, I know there are, uh, somebody asked about myopic uh, macular degeneration. Yes, the, what happens in, uh, you know, very short-sighted people is that the, uh, the back of their eye, the retina behaves like um, the, the retina or macula of an older person. In other words, the macula in uh, myopic eyes ages more quickly than the normal. So they develop these abnormal blood, leaking blood vessels similar to what happens in wet air macular degeneration. And again, so we, we sort of traditionally have treated you know, myopic macular degeneration the same way as we do age-related macular degeneration. NICE consistently refused to make any pronouncement on, on the treatment of a myopic CNV with Lucentis or the other treatments because there wasn't enough data. But I can assure you now we have enough data and NICE is actually looking at it. So hopefully uh, NICE um, um, by, the, by December should be able to say, yes, you should be able to treat myopic CNV with Lucentis. But depending on where you live, some of the PCTs will fund actually Lucentis whilst others will say, well, because there's not enough, uh, NICE hasn't made a decision, we'll give you a Vastin if you prefer that. But otherwise, you'll have to pay for the Lucentis, unfortunately. 